Well, good morning. How many of you knew when you would show up at 8.30 that the crowd would look like this? I did. I knew you all were going to be here. I just knew it. It is so good to look out and see all of you. I'm guessing that there's about 150 or 200 people in the other service right now. So this is uh, just exciting that people are up this early. Who knew that making a half hour change would make that much of a difference? And some of you are saying, you know what, we're just trying it out today. 11 o'clock may be the time next week. I don't know. But we're just glad that you're here. This, you've heard it said many times, our 32 year, year anniversary. And we're just so thankful for what God has done as we began ministry here in Urbandale 32 years ago this weekend. God had placed on Pastor Weaver's heart uh, a vision. And I'm so thankful that he was obedient to follow through and do what God is asking him to do. Uh, a little unconventional, that would be the word I would use to describe Pastor Weaver. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it works, and uh, if you know him, you know his heart. And I just want to greet all of you from him. He is preaching in the other service this morning. And so he said, make sure to greet everybody for me. And so I'm bringing greetings from Pastor Weaver. Um, and so he's, he and I are preaching a similar message today. We uh, kind of collaborated a little bit, and we're preaching live in both places. So uh, we're, uh, we're, we're trying it out. We'll see how it goes. Hey, this also being our anniversary Sunday, uh, we are recognizing new members. And it's been since November of 2019 that we recognize members, and we have 82 new members that we are receiving and recognizing in the last three years. So I want to ask if your name is on this list, if you become a new member in the last three years, if you would just stand, and we want to just recognize you visually, and I know we're spread out over four services, but if that's, that's you this morning, we just want to say welcome. We're so honored. If you'll stay standing, stay standing, I want to just, I just want to pray for you guys. Father, I thank you for this church, for this body, this congregation. Lord, I thank you for the mission that you've given us. And Lord, we are just doing our best to try to honor you and follow you as best we can. And I thank you for your people. God, I thank you for these who have become official members of the church and the responsibilities that come with that. I thank you that they are all in on that. And I just pray your blessing upon them individually, uh, where they serve in ministry throughout uh, our church body, for their families, God, for their witness and their testimony outside of these walls. God, I just pray your blessing on them. I thank you, God, for how you guide and direct and lead our lives, and thank you for leading them here and them becoming uh, members of this church. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here, and we just pray your blessing, God, on, on, on their lives and on our time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you so much. We're honored to have you as members of our church. Well, was there anything else that I needed to, uh, to do? I'm trying to think of all of that. Just want to greet all of those who are joining online at 830. And if you missed that message, you're watching this at another time than 830. But we're glad that you're here uh, joining us this morning. Uh, for all that helped this week, we've virtually flipped this building this week. We have all of the rooms upstairs are now adult classes. We got all the kids' classes set up and a lot of, a lot of changes that took place and a lot of people helping with that. And we are, we're blessed to have a church with people who love and give and serve. Let's get into the message this morning. The title of my message this morning is Having Faith in a Big Faith in a Big God Who Does Big Things. We have a God who does big things. And this morning, I want to motivate you I want to inspire you, if I at all possibly can, and challenge you to have big faith. I want us to understand today that we have a big God. We serve a big God who is so powerful, he's so awesome, he's so amazing, he literally is indescribable. And if, as I try to tell you who he is, there's no way that I can tell you all about who God is, he's indescribable, but, but you can have big faith today in a big God who does really big things because he's able to do things that you can't even imagine in your wildest dreams. At the end of my message this morning, we're gonna be praying. I wanna invite you to come as a church. Maybe this morning you, uh, need, you need faith for some thing in your life for your life individually. Maybe it's something you need a miracle for your family or, or it's your business or you just realize today as we talk about faith 
and having big faith in a big God who does big things that you're realizing, hey, I'm all in on my faith and I'm all in on whatever it is that God is calling me to do because I think that there's some of us here in the room, probably many of us, God has put a, a, a vision, an idea, a mission on your heart and you have not taken a step of faith in that. It's an idea, it's a dream, it's a thought that you've had and it's a God-given, it's a God-given dream and you've been sitting waiting and I believe that today is a day where you can take a step of faith and just really see all that God has for you. And so we're going to be ending our time with prayer and we're going to be believing God for great things. Have you ever tried to imagine just how big God is? With all the knowledge that we've amassed over history of mankind, we've barely scratched the surface of understanding and comprehending who God really is and how great he is. I mean, how can a limited mind understand an unlimited God who is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, meaning that he's all-knowing, all-powerful, he's present everywhere. How does a finite, temporary human being who is born and will someday die, that's all of us, by the way, how do we comprehend a God who is infinite and eternal, who has no beginning and no end? Psalm 8 speaks of the greatness and the bigness of God. And this is what it says in Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky, how many of you have ever done that? Just take time at night to look up at the sky. The psalmist says, when I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, and I'm just amazed that the songs that we sang this morning speak of that, of the heavens and the stars and all that God has done. When I, when I look into the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge over everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. That speaks of the bigness and the immensity of God and the fact that he, while he's the one who put the stars in their place, he created us and he knows us and he wants a relationship with us. And he gave us a place just under him. He gave us authority over everything else that he created. This is our great God. He says, when I look into the night sky, the moon and all the stars that you set in place, it makes me realize how great, how awesome, and how mighty you really are. And I think how small and insignificant that I feel. And who am I that you would think about me? Who am I? that you would care for me. I know many times I have memories of myself laying on a cot or laying on the top of my car, looking up at all the stars in the sky and realizing, I can't, I can't even imagine what I'm looking at here. Have you ever tried to count the stars? And it makes me feel so small. But listen to what Isaiah says, Isaiah 40, 26. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and his incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. He counts the stars. This is Psalm 147, verse 5. He counts the stars and he calls them by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. I'm trying to get you to understand this morning that our God is big. He created the stars. He counts the stars and he knows each of them by name and he doesn't miss a single one. How many stars are there in the heavens? A lot. Listen, for man, this is overwhelming. To count the stars is absolutely beyond our capacity, it's beyond our capability. I wanna to try to get you to understand how big God is. If you could count the stars, all of the stars, how long would it take you to count all the stars just in the Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy that we're in? They say that there is about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. 
So if you were to count those stars one per second, that would take 100 billion seconds. See how I did that math? A hundred billion seconds is how long? If you were to count one second every star, a hundred billion stars, it would take you 3,171 years. Name them just like that. 3,171 years and that's the Milky Way galaxy. You know that they say that there is possibly a hundred billion, billions hundreds of billions of galaxies beyond the, the Milky Way. I don't know how much of all that I believe, but I believe that there's something out there. They've seen it with, this, with the telescopes. Some people say that there could be two trillion galaxies. So you do the math and add all of that, that's a lot of stars. How big, just to understand how big this Milky Way galaxy that we're in. The speed of light you travel 186,000 miles per second. Some of you think driving 80 miles an hour is fast. 186,000 miles, not per minute, not per hour, but per second. If you were to travel 186,000 miles per second, in a year you would travel 5.88 trillion miles, and that is a light year. One light year is 5.88 trillion miles in a year. It would take you 100,000 years to go from one end of the Milky Way galaxy to the other. Can you just begin to fathom how big our God is? I want you to see that he is a huge God who created the stars, he counts the stars, he knows all of their names. God is infinitely more powerful, more knowledgeable, more wise than the sum of all of mankind. He knows everything. There is nothing that he does not know. Our God is a big God, and he does big things. Jeremiah 32, 17. O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and your powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God says this just 10 verses later. He says, I am the Lord, the God of the peoples of the world. Is anything too hard for me? That's a rhetorical question. He's saying absolutely nothing is too hard for me. The psalmist says in Psalm 86, verse eight, no pagan God is like you, O Lord. None can do what you do. All the nations you made will come and bow before you, Lord, and they will praise your holy name, for you are great and you perform wonderful deeds. You alone are God. He is a big God who does big things. God can do whatever he wants to do. There's nothing that he can't do. Nothing is too difficult for him. I love this verse in Psalm 115, verse three, that says, our God is in the heavens and he does as he wishes. Wouldn't it be awesome to just do whatever you wanna do and know that there's nothing that could stop you? Our God is in the heavens and he does as he wishes. Psalm 119, 68, God, you are good and you do only good. You are good and you do only good. Ephesians 3.20, Paul talks about God being able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. That's some incredible language. Exceedingly abundantly above all. I want you to listen to what the message version says. Ephesians 3.20, God can do anything, you know. God can do anything, you know. Sounds kind of a North Dakota thing. <laughs> you know? God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. God can do anything, you know. Do you know that God can do anything? He's a big God and he does big things. Why would we ever second guess? Why would we ever question that God could handle our circumstances? Why would we ever question that God may not know what we need? God knows everything. There's nothing that he doesn't know. And there's nothing that he cannot do. I think we're making that point. Go back to Genesis chapter one. God created everything from nothing by just speaking a word. He spoke and it was. God parted the Red Sea for the Israelites to escape the Egyptians. Not only that, they walked across on dry ground. God backed up the waters of the Jordan River when the Israelites crossed into the Promised Land. And guess what? They walked over on 
on dry ground. They did that. Joshua prayed to God that God would make the sun stand still, and guess what the sun did? For 24 hours, the sun stood still until they fought and won the battle. Last week, Pastor Zach talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this is the statement of faith that they said, we know, we, we know that our God is able to deliver us, and we believe that he will, but even if he doesn't. And I want to say, that's not just a little caveat just to make an escape clause for God. They're saying, look, we believe, we 100% believe that our God is able to deliver us from the furnace, that you can put us in a furnace and we're not going to burn up. How many of your minds think that way? Do you have that kind of faith? Do you have that kind of big faith to know God can deliver me from that furnace? And I believe that he's going to do it. But they're saying, even if he doesn't, we're still not doing what you tell us to do. We're going to honor and obey God. And listen, they were thrown into the fire and God saved them. Not only was there not a hair on their body that was singed, there wasn't the uh, smell of smoke on their clothes. You guys are quiet today. Our God is amazing. Jesus performed incredible miracles in his time here on earth. The dead were raised to life. The blind people received sight. Deaf people got their hearing. Lame people could walk. Sicknesses and diseases of all kinds were healed. And on and on the story goes. He still does big things because he's a big God. He does big and amazing things today. Do you believe that? So we have a big God who does big things. How many of you need a miracle today? How many of you need God to do something in your, in your life, in your situation, in your circumstances? Anybody here? Anybody in need of God to come into your life and provide something that you can't figure out how it's going to work out? You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to go. But God does. And God is able. Or you have the kind of faith to believe. We're going to pray at the end here in just a moment. I've got to my, my last point here. God is able to, and he wants to do, the impossible in your, in, your, in your life. We have a big God who does big things, and he's asking for big faith, to trust him. Listen to a few of these quotes. A.W. Tozer said, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. You ever made a plan that you, that you thought, I have no idea how this is going to work out? We like to make plans that we go, I know exactly how this is going to go. How many of us make plans and we have the X factor and we go, eh, that's only going to take, it's only going to be God if this works out. Do we plan that way? That's faith. George Mueller, the great evangelist and missionary, said, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There's no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. If it's humanly possible, God gets no glory for it. He is all about the impossible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Warren Wiersbe said this, our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, to do what seems unreasonable, and to expect what is impossible. Let me read that again. Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, to do what seems unreasonable, and to expect what seems impossible. D.L. Moody said this, if, your God is your part, if God is your partner, then make your plans big and make them impossible. And you know that God will have to come through. We serve a big God who does big things, and I want to challenge all of us today as individuals, as families, as a church, to be people of faith who seek God for the impossible and believe him for miracles. There were two times in scripture where it records that Jesus was amazed. And both of those had to do with faith. But he was amazed for two different reasons. Mark 6 records a time when Jesus was in his hometown of Nazareth and he was teaching in the synagogue and it says that many who heard him were amazed. They heard Jesus speaking and they were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and power to perform such miracles? He's just a carpenter. We know him. He's Joseph and Mary's son. We know his brothers and sisters. They live right here among us. And it says that they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. And Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6 says that because of their unbelief, Jesus could, could, could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. 
Two times in scripture it says that Jesus was amazed. This first one says that he was amazed at the people in his hometown, their lack of faith. There was another time when Jesus uh, was amazed. It was a Roman centurion who approached him and said, Jesus, I need you to heal my sick servant. And Jesus heads off for his house and the Roman soldier intercepts him and says, look, I'm not worthy for you to come into my home. I believe that you just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus, the scripture says that he was amazed at him. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following, Jesus said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And this was a Roman centurion. So two times that Jesus was amazed. The lack of faith in Nazareth and the Roman centurion's great faith. And so I want to ask you this question this morning. If Jesus looked at your faith level, if Jesus looked at your faith this morning, would he be amazed at how big and bold your faith is? Or would Jesus be amazed at how small and deficient your faith is? Where is your faith this morning? God says, I can do all things. Nothing is too difficult for me. God has never failed. Nowhere in the Bible do we read where God got really, uh, God tried really, really hard, but things just didn't work out. He tried really hard, but it just didn't work out. God knows the answer to every situation that you're facing right now. He knows what the answer is. He knows who he will use. He knows where the answer will come from. He knows how to fix things. And he is always there at the right time. God's timing, everything about him is perfect. Listen, our problem is that we measure we measure God's ability by our own abilities or our lack of ability. Meaning, we lump God in with us. And because we can't do it, because we don't know it, because we've never experienced it, we somehow assume that God is saying right along with us, yep, you're right. I really have no idea how this is gonna happen. Said God never. Never is he ever like looking at something going, I don't know what to do. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're thinking right. I'm scratching my head too, I don't understand. We measure God's ability by our understanding and what we do is we make God way too small. We make God way too small because our God is a big God and there is nothing that he cannot do. We ask questions like, how could this possibly work out? In John 6, we read about Jesus feeding 5,000. A huge crowd gathered and Jesus asked the disciples, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? 5,000 men plus women and children. And Jesus is asking a question. Where can we buy bread to feed these people? And Philip replied, Jesus, even if all of us worked for months, we still wouldn't have enough money to feed this crowd. John chapter 6, verse 8, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and he said, hey, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. That sounds like great faith, doesn't it? Except he follows up by saying, but what good is that with a huge crowd like this? Hey, I got a boy here who's got a sack lunch. A couple fish, five loaves. But what are we going to do about that? What good is that? He's trying to do the math in his head. He's going, okay, I got some food here, but this, this doesn't compute. He's trying to add it up in his head, trying to figure out. And he's asking this question, how could this possibly work? I don't really understand. But listen, having faith doesn't mean that you have to understand. Having faith does not mean that you have to understand. How many of you ever said, I just don't get it. I don't know how this is going to work out. How could this possibly work out? Anybody ever said that before? Faith says, I don't have to understand. We're just required to believe, to trust and obey. You see, God helps us in areas of life that are impossible because he knows that we're gonna face more impossible situations. And he wants you to be able to look back at your life and see his ability is limitless. God is good and he does good. Psalm 119, 68 that I read to you earlier. He's faithful to his people. He's a big God who does big things. So in this story, 
Jesus multiplies those five loaves and those two fish. Most of us know this story, right? 5,000 men plus women and children. He takes these five loaves and these two fish and he begins to break them and he says, listen, go pass this out. And after everybody had everything that they needed, after everybody had eaten till they were full, it says that they gathered up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Does that compute in your head? This is the God that we serve. Five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets full of leftovers. How many disciples were there? Hmm. Every one of those disciples got a basket full of leftovers to remind them of just what God can do. Isn't that amazing? Because the rest of their lives, if they came up against another impossible situation, they would remember the time that God did a miracle so big that there were leftovers. Now, this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is in all four Gospels. Very few stories are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's in all four of them. And in three of those Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, the very next verses that follow that is the story of Peter walking on water. In John, it says that evening they went out on a boat. In Matthew and Mark, I want to read for you in Matthew chapter 14, but it says this, immediately after this. So after Jesus has gathered, had them gather up all the leftovers, 12 baskets full, each of the disciples have a basket in their hand, and it says that immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. So I don't know if they all took their basket and they took their basket in the boat, but very well, very likely those baskets full of leftovers could have been in the boat with them. Unless they had given them to someone to take home, they were in the boat with them. Verse 23, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. And about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. In the middle of the night, Jesus is walking toward them on the water. You don't walk on water. People don't walk on water. That shouldn't fit your calculations. People don't walk on water. But Jesus does because he's a big God, right? He created the water. Sure, he can figure out how to walk on the water. He knows how to do this. But it scared them. It says that they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, do not be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. The greatest words that you could ever hear from Jesus. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. I'm here. I'm with you. And over and over and over in Scripture, he tells us this. He's with us. Why would we fear? Why would we worry? Why would we think things aren't going to work out? Do you get the idea today? We've got a big God who does big things. We just have to put our faith in him. Somebody here is going to ask for the impossible. We just saw Jesus do the impossible, the feeding of the 5,000, right? Five, 12 baskets of, of leftovers. And one of them calls out, and this Peter, Peter called out to him and said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Why would he think that? Tell me to come to you on the water. He's asking for the impossible. I want to remind you that all the disciples were in the boat. Peter gets a bad rap because he steps out, walks on the water, gets his eyes off Jesus and sinks. He's a failure. But think about the 11 other guys in the boat that never stepped out of the boat. We're talking about big faith. Peter just gets out of the boat and said, listen, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to get on the water and come to you. And it says that he got out of the boat. When was the last time you asked God for something impossible? We're talking about people of faith. When have you asked God for something impossible? And I mean, with the idea that, God, I know that you can do this. And I believe that you will. Do you have that kind of faith? What are you asking for? What impossible thing do you want to see God do? We have to understand that it's not us that's doing the impossible. God is the one who does the impossible. God can do anything, you know. God can do anything, you know. 
far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. Do you understand how powerful your ask is? You're asking God, the one who can do absolutely anything, or has the devil bankrupted your faith and caused you to believe, yeah, he wouldn't do that for me. That is from the enemy. We're talking about faith here. He can make you believe that your prayers are going to make a bit of difference. But listen, if you want God to do the impossible, you just have to ask. The second thing is you've got to get your eyes off of the storm. See, if I had been in the boat, I probably wouldn't. I know that I wouldn't have asked Jesus for me to walk on the water. I'd have probably prayed a prayer. God, if it's really you, make the wave stop. Calm the storm. Looking at the circumstances. Wanting them to be better. Listen, it's way too easy to be consumed by the storm. It's way too easy to be consumed by the storm that's around us. We've got a mess here. What are we going to do? You ever thought that? What am I going to do? What are we going to do? And God's just saying, why don't you leave the mess in my hands? I can do anything. You've got to get your eyes off the storm. The storm in your life is no reason not to ask God for the impossible. Listen, the storm does not control the power of God. The power of God is controlling the storm. Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, yes. Yes. Come. So Peter went over the side of the boat and he walked toward Jesus. That's amazing to me. That's big faith. Jesus could have lifted Peter right out of the boat, but he didn't do that. Peter had to step out on his own. What would it take for you to step out in faith and believe God for the impossible? How many of you got an impossible situation? Listen, I'm talking to you individually. You're saying, God, how, where, where am I going? What am I doing? How is this going to work? I've got a situation in my family, in our home. In my, in my business, in my workplace. Listen, we are too tied to playing things safe and we're not thinking about the impossible. But it's a day to day for us to have big faith and we can have big faith because we've got a big God who does absolutely big things. There's nothing that he can't do. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this morning? How many of you this morning, there's things that God has spoken you to, for you to do? He's given you a, a, a vision, a mission, a challenge. You individually, it's time for you to step out. How many of you would say, I'm stepping out today? Today, I need to believe God for my family. Today, I need to believe God for something in my own life. Today, I need to believe God, and I need to trust him completely. How many of you are just going to sit in the boat with, like the other disciples? Or are you going to look at God and say, God, I need you, and I want you, and I'd rather be with you than be in this boat with these stinky guys? Can we believe God for the impossible? Listen, look what God has done right here. This is impossible. He put me together with Pastor Weaver. If he's saying that on that side, they're probably laughing too. We're the two most unlikely characters to ever match up and be a team. We're like Tom and Jerry. It's true. It's God. It's totally God. And I don't want it to be anything but God. So for our future going forward as a church, together we need to have faith. We need to put our eyes on Jesus and get our eyes off of the world around us. All the garbage and the junk that you can see on TV, that is not a thing for God. God's not scared by conspiracies. God's not scared by diseases. He's not scared by ideas that people have about any of those things. Do you realize that? He's got a bigger view of all of that than, than, than you do in any of us. Why don't we just listen to him and follow him and trust him? How many of you need a miracle today? You really need a miracle. You need God to come through. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to end by singing a song. Can we just sing the Jesus song? I think it would be appropriate. We've got some time here. We've got some time to pray. And I want to see God do miracles. Can we do that? If you need a miracle, just come to the front. We have a few pastors, Pastor Carrie and I. 
We've got some pastors who are here who may not be on staff, but you're a pastor. You've got a pastor's heart. You've been a pastor. You know how to pray. You just got a ministry. You know how to pray for people. Listen, if Jesus is in you, then you come and pray for people. But those that, that need a miracle, you need a touch from God, would you just come to the front? And we're going to gather together around people. We're going to pray and believe that God's going to meet us right here. That we're going to see miracles. Miracles because we have a big God who does big things. And it just takes us having faith in him to do whatever he wants to do, to do whatever he needs to do. Let him have his way in your life. If you believe in God and you want to just be part of this, this church, you're saying, listen, I, I'm going to be all in. And I'm just going to step in. I'm going to step out of the boat in faith. I'm not going to sit on the sidelines anymore. I'm all in. I want you to come and just show your, your, your support for these people and just say, listen, I'm in. I'm all in by faith. I'm going to trust God for big things in my life. Let's pray. When you are in a storm in a boat and you don't know what to do, it's not Ghostbusters. It's Jesus. If we truly believe that he is who he said he is, then we've got to believe that there's power in his name. And he's not just a name that we can use flippantly and do whatever we want to do. But there is power in the name of Jesus. We believe that he can. We believe that he's able. Even if he doesn't do what we ask him to do, we're still going to trust him. We're still going to believe. Because I can't see the plan. I don't know the purpose. But God does. And if we will just lean into him and believe him and trust him, have faith, big faith, big faith in a big God who does really, really big things. I believe that there's healings that's taken place here this morning. And here's what I want to challenge you. If you receive something from the Lord, then you give testimony. You give testimony of what God has done, what God is doing. Don't keep it silent. Don't keep it quiet. I believe that God has great things in store for our future. For you individually, for your family. I believe that God has great things in store for our future as a church. Beyond what we can think or imagine in our wildest dreams, Ephesians 3.20. Would you have that kind of faith to be all in, to say, God, however you want to use me, you use me. Let me be in your hands. You shaping me, you making me, you doing what you want to. Could it be that the challenges that you're facing are an opportunity for God to just work a miracle so that you can give glory and honor to him? So that somebody else's life is touched and changed and affected for eternity. Praise be to God. I believe that God's going to do that right here at New Hope. And he's going to do it across this city. Because you live all across the city. We have people that live 90 miles away from here to take the testimony of what God can do and what God has done and let your light shine for him wherever. We don't just serve a God who gives us whatever we want to because we said, hey, I can ask whatever I want. Yes, you can. We should ask in faith, believing, because if we don't ask, we're not going to receive. But let's have the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We believe that God is able to do it. We know that he is able, we believe that he can, but even if he doesn't, we're all in. God, you give us that kind of faith. God, we're trusting you, believing you with the future of our lives. Every day of our life, every moment that we live, may we look to you and have that kind of faith to, to ask for big things, to be willing to, to get our eyes off of the storm and get our eyes on you and be willing to step out of the boat and take a step toward you. God, I know that you will meet us there. Lord, I pray that our faith, that you would be amazed, God, not because of our lack of faith, but because of our faith in you, that you can do all things. Pour out your spirit. Pour out your power. Use us in a mighty way, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Amen.